What is up, everyone? This is your host, Eric Holtzman, and welcome to the Mindful Motion Podcast. What is up, everybody? So I'm here with Charlie Cates. We're here to discuss how exercise for life, how to exercise for life in a healthy, safe, and efficient way so you can create a body that is resilient, thriving, and pain-free. Charlie is a husband, father, personal trainer, a muscle activation technique specialist. He's also the host of the Exercises Health podcast, the author of the Exercise for Life Method, and the owner of Muscle Activation Schomburg in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. That's a very impressive resume you built for yourself there, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. So I'm actually really excited about this because uh, I look up to you in a lot of ways. You have a lot of passion, energy. You've done a lot of really amazing things for your business, and you do it with you know, two young children and a wife. So there's a lot going on in your life. Um, yeah. and you're a bit unique in a way um, and have things that you've dealt with. If I'm not mistaken, you have um, you were born with type one diabetes, correct? Yeah, I was diagnosed when I was nine, but still very young. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And that maybe led you to uh, think of exercise in different ways and mm-hmm. have different, um, hurdles that other people haven't had. So I think mm-hmm. a lot of people might gather value from some of those experiences that you've had. I'd love to kick this off with just kind of going over a little bit about yourself, how you got into the you sure. know, industry, what that journey was like for you. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, um, you know, all growing up, I played sports like sports was my form of exercise and any additional working out outside of sports was all geared towards helping me perform in sports. Basketball was my thing. Uh, so, you know, by the time I was in eighth grade, I was pretty into lifting weights, but I started getting more and more into plyometrics and feeling like my body getting stronger, my body changing. And I was like, oh, holy crap. Like there's actually like I put effort in over here and I get a greater outcome over here. This is awesome. I'm going to keep doing that thing. And so I trained pretty heavily through high school, was fortunate enough to play basketball in college, trained through college. um, And really, my focus was sports performance. That was going to be my thing. I had a couple of different sports performance internships, uh, one just south of you in San Diego, um, another in the Midwest here um, in Madison, Wisconsin, or just outside Madison. Anyways, uh, my whole thing was going to be sports performance. Um, And then I was supposed to have a job in Connecticut uh, after I graduated college. Uh, It was going to be doing like some personal training stuff. But, you know, again, like my focus was sports and working with athletes Uh, that ended up falling through because the place ended up going bankrupt. And so then from there, I ended up in Chicago. And the first uh, place that I worked in Chicago, it had two MAT practitioners um, and I had never seen MAT before. I had never heard of it before, but all I knew is I kept going to the back of the gym with my clients after my sessions and, you know, stretching them and, you know, having them do foam rolling and everything like that. Um, And these guys were doing something different. And I was like, okay, well, like, what is this thing that you're doing? And so they were telling me about it a little bit. um, And you know, eventually wanted to say, Hey, you know, just get on the table. Let me work on you. And so he, um, he worked on me. And once I got up off the table, um, you know, I had had some like no like major injuries during college, but you know, a lot of ankle sprains and everything like that. So my body was really tight. My body was super tight. Um, I was actually, you know, 23, 24 years old, like the way I describe it, like my body was just broken. Um, I, it just felt terrible all the time. Uh, but with the first time I experienced MAT, like all these light bulbs started going off in my head of like, oh, wow, this is a way that it wasn't like a pain thing for me. It was like, this is how I can get my muscles to function closer to optimum. So then when I go and work out, I can have a system that is, you know, functioning better and I can get more from the workout. So that was like the view, the lens that I viewed that through. Um, and then from there, you know, I started uh, taking the classes and everything like that um, in 2014, um, my wife and I opened up our own place in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. Um, And at that time, I was kind of going through, uh, I was going through grad school, really focusing more on how to use exercise to actually build our health, Um, like what needs to happen with your workouts in order for your brain health to improve your cardiovascular health, everything like that. So I was learning these different components in grad school and then trying to apply them in our business uh, using MAT to get people ready to exercise, using exercise to help people build their health. And that was kind of the process. Um, 
And, and, but all along that path, like I was noticing all these other changes within my body. Like when I would change how I'd exercise, my body would feel so much better. I'd actually leave my workout feeling stronger, feeling more mobile. Um, that tightness that I was having before, it wasn't there when I would change how I'd work out, when I would take care of myself outside of my workouts in ways that I wasn't doing before with, you know, my chronic stretching and my rolling and everything like that. And just focus on the health and function and the strength of my muscles. Um, and so that really became kind of the, the foundational principle that we based like our entire business around is like, Hey, if you're going to do these things in your life, you know, what, whatever it is, play with your kids, play with your grandkids, go skiing, go hiking, just live your life in general. Like you need to have muscles that are functioning well. And so that became kind of the, the drum that we are beating in our predominant message, um, and then from there, I kind of got into looking at, okay, but is there more to it than that? Is there more to it than just like changing how somebody feels or somebody's strength from a muscle perspective? Like what's actually the role of muscles in our overall health? And so that is when kind of in 2019, things started to develop um, and I started to explore more of this idea of like the role of muscles in longevity, the role of, of muscles in brain health, cardiovascular health, uh, disease prevention, everything like that. Um, and so that really is where my focus has been kind of coming up on four years now. Okay. Yeah. That's um, it's funny because, you know, people don't really view exercise in that lens. Typically they just kind of have the superficial goals, right? Mm -hmm. Let me look better. I want to be sexy. I want my shirt off. Mm -hmm. I want to Back, that kind of thing right People forget, you know it's a, an organ system and it it's a sink for glucose it's a sink for hormones it mm -hmm. distributes blood throughout the system it can take stress off some of the organs and help them function better and so it's so confusing i think for the lay person out in the industry mm -hmm. uh get so much information and it's it's generalized information which can help initially but then when you want to target things for individual people mm -hmm. it starts to out very quickly as right. you're saying too, right you might follow this eight sets of eight or 12 reps for three sets and it might be too much or not enough. And how do you determine that with people? Mm -hmm. So how do you dose exercise for individual clients? How do you determine what's too much stress or what's not enough stress? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, it, it stems from like the foundational philosophy that your workout today needs to set you up to come back and work out again tomorrow. OK, a lot of times in the fitness industry, we're told, OK, you need to work out today and then you're going to take the next 24, 48, 72 hours to recover. And that should be the norm. And then you come back and you do this thing again. The problem with that is if you're taking those 24, 48, 72 hours to recover because your body is so beat up from your workout, eventually the question is going to cross your mind of like, do I really want to do that again? And some people continue to answer yes to that. And some people are able to answer yes to that for decades. Most people, when they try to answer yes to that, eventually their body says, yeah, I don't care if you feel like you're going to go do this today. We're shutting this down. Like you're not doing this anymore. And we see this so often with sports, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to keep playing basketball until my body says, oh, yeah, it's just you're just not going to keep doing that anymore. Right. So when you the problem with that, though, is when you apply that mindset to an exercise perspective. Now, all of a sudden, if you put an end date or a retirement date on, on when you're going to exercise, now you're saying, well, this is the end date of when I'm going to stop getting the health benefits of exercise. Mm. And that's a really dangerous place for people to be because exercise is something that you should be able to do for the entirety of your life. But it, sh it takes a shift of um, how you think about exercise, how you define exercise, and how you approach your exercise. So the first thing that, that we approach all of our clients with is this idea that your workout today needs to set you up to come back and work out again tomorrow. Okay, that's baseline. All right. Then from there, there's going to be some trial and error. There's going to be some guess and check. But there are things that you can monitor within the time that you, you're either working out yourself or you're working with a client to say like, okay, yeah, we're going in the right direction or things are starting to go downhill. Like somebody's range of motion, all right? They're subject to symptoms. If there's any pain, if there's any tightness, if there's any difficulty performing the motion, if it's changing, if those things are changing in the wrong direction, then we're going in the wrong direction from a health perspective. The other thing that I will add into that is awareness. Okay. Meaning like if you're going through and, and the, you, 
you've heard of like this mind muscle connection. Okay. If you start your work, you're like, Oh yeah, I got a strong mind muscle connection to my chest. Like I can feel those muscles contracting. And then like two or three sets in, you're like, okay, this just feels like general fatigue now, like throughout the front of my upper body. It doesn't feel like really specific here anymore. It's like, okay, you're losing that awareness piece. Okay, now, now that that's a sign that we can start backing off or we need to stop this. And those are early warning signs before they wake up the next day and feel like, wow, I just got hit by a truck. Or before they finish their workout, like, I just need to go take a three hour nap because my body's feeling slow depleted. So instead of thinking about it, so, so th that's really the big shift is like, your workout today needs to set you up to come back and work out again tomorrow. And then within that, within your workout time, how do you feel like your joints are moving? How do you feel like that mind muscle connection is? And then how do you feel like that, that persists over kind of like the hours and days that, that follow your workout. And as long as during your workout, you can feel like, okay, subjective symptoms are not getting worse or maybe getting better. Range of motion is not worse. It's maybe getting better. My awareness, my mind muscle connection is not getting worse. It's maybe getting better. You're going in the right direction. Anytime any of those change, it's like, okay, cool. Now, now we put the brakes on. Okay. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. I mean, even Tom Purvis would say that. And now what I was asking is like, when is the exercise? When is the exercise? without short of having like, you know, sensors on your arm to tell you how much you desaturated the tissue or something, you really don't have objective information other than what you're saying. It's like you're doing chest press, you're contracting, and now this is sort of numb. You can't feel it much anymore. You probably hit that threshold of what you can tolerate. And I've done that too. I've done sets where I'm like, I can't feel this and I keep going and I'm sore for like three days. And sure. like, I don't mind that because that's, you know, I'm used to it, but it's not sure. pleasant. And most people will be deterred from doing it again, like you're saying, and that, that's a service for them long term, right? So, right. and unfortunately, that's how most people are introduced to exercise. It's right. like with with the assumption that you should feel lousy after. And if you can switch that that belief in people's mind that like actually you don't have to feel lousy after, and you can still get really good results by implementing everything that uh, that that Tom has taught along the way of you know like how to structure the exercise and you can bring people's like awareness to the stuff. Now all of a sudden, people are gonna be like, okay, cool, this exercise thing that I thought I could only do like two or three times a week, I can actually do every day, and now they have an opportunity to build their health every day. Do you think this applies, though, in the same framework for people who really want to maximize like muscle growth? So I think there is a timeline that needs to be considered. OK, um, so to me, you get short term results with intensity. You get long term results with consistency. So somebody's like, OK, I want to try to, you know, slap on 20 pounds of muscle over the next 12 weeks, that's going to take some intense, you know, action for the next 12 weeks. But if somebody's like, Hey, I want to put on, you know, 12 pounds, uh, 20 pounds of muscle over the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. Well, the name of the game with that isn't intensity, it's consistency. Yeah. And so, so the timeline really is, is what's in question. Unfortunately, because of um, the way fitness is marketed, Everything is or not everything, but most things are brought up as like a really condensed timeline, this 30 day challenge, this six week program, this 12 week transformation. And so we get it in our minds that like, well, this thing should only last. Well, you know, we're trying to get the maximum results that we can in the next 30 days. It's like, OK, but what about day 31? Where are you going to be left then? Right. And like we've, we've worked with clients that have gone through that whole process of like, oh, I'm just trying to crush it for the next 30 days. And like, OK, cool. Now, where are you at? Like, especially if you work with any kind of like endurance athlete or whatever, somebody who's maybe not an endurance athlete, but they're trying to do an endurance event. It's like, OK, cool. But how are you going to feel the day after your half marathon? I'm not saying don't do the half marathon, but understand if we're talking about wanting to run your best half marathon time in the next three weeks versus running your best half marathon time over the next three years. Mm -hmm. Those, those timelines are completely different. And so then the approach to training is completely different. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, they market things like that for the sake of trying to hook people in because it's mm -hmm. not sexy to say a uh, three year challenge, you know, it's like, that's no, just exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Do this for the next 45 years and you'll see some results. Like what? <laughs> yeah, But I mean, that's the way real life is, right? There's yeah. no shortcuts. I think we all can understand that, but mm -hmm. 
we're easily manipulated. <laughs> right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We want to believe that there is some magic out there that if we just understand this one secret, now all the all the the uh, the dominoes are going to knock over. Everything's going to fall into place. You're going to be like, see, I knew I could get this body in six weeks. It's like mm. that, that, it doesn't work that way. It, it, it just doesn't. Um, but instead, if you can understand the magic of consistency, now all of a sudden you have an opportunity to make some really cool changes in your health, in your function, in your performance. For sure. And not really suffer that much. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you light up when you, type, when you talk about exercise. So what is it about exercise that you're so passionate about? Man, um, so one thing that I really like about exercise is the the ability for somebody to expand, the ability to grow, like to challenge yourself in a way that is in by all by by all um, by all measures like relatively safe, right? Like a lot of times when somebody feels like, oh, I'm going to grow, I'm going to challenge myself. Um, you know, if it's like public speaking or something like that, it can, there's this like vulnerability that's attached to it. And it can feel very unsafe. Now for some people, exercise may feel unsafe in that way, but I think if you can provide like a very safe and welcoming environment, it doesn't have to feel that way. And so when you can get people to, um, to buy into this idea that like this exercise thing, it's actually super important. It's actually super necessary. And by doing it, you not only like physically does your strength improve and your fitness improve, everything like that, but the things that matter most to you in life, you get to enjoy those so much more. And, the, and those things matter. You know, they, that, that's, that's really what gets me excited about it is because it, exercise becomes, it becomes an amplifier mm -hmm. for people's life. Instead of like a burden of the thing that they need to go do for, you know, 45 minutes, three times a week or whatever. It's like, this is the thing that makes the rest of your life better. And when you can change how you go about doing it, it has that opportunity, not just from a physical function perspective, from a health perspective, from like a focus perspective, like being present with your kids, being less stressed by all the little, you know, pings and dings that, that, that happen throughout our day you get to be the best version of yourself and exercise can be a medium to help get you there. Um, and I think that's so powerful. And I think it's, it's a message that is not delivered enough within the fitness industry because we're all worried about, you know, how to get our six pack abs for summer. Yeah, totally. I think that saying it's an amplifier is a, a really uh, great way to, for, for people to like resonate with that, with that concept. Um, you know, I really, you wrote a book. I'm really interested in what that process was like, like, yeah, what hired you to write it. Like how did that whole thing work out? I'm, I'm cool. curious. No, thank you for asking. So, um, it really started in, so in 2019, uh, my wife and I put on an event in our local area. It's called the Schaumburg health summit. All right. It was going to be like this TEDx type event for health practitioners in our area. And it, it, it was Awesome. Like we had 75 people in attendance. We had a DJ, we had catered food, we had 11 speakers, we had just like rows of vendors. Like it was, it was awesome. Out this ballroom in the hotel, it was so cool. And I was going to be the final speaker of the day. And so I knew that I wanted to deliver a message that not only was about exercise, but was something that like would really be impactful for people's lives. And so I was thinking, okay, like what would actually matter to people from an exercise perspective? perspective. And so I think, you know, a lot of times we hear that exercise can help us live longer, but we're not really told, like, that's just kind of the, the end of the conversation. It's like, oh yeah, exercise, you live longer, but we're not told like what you need to do or if any type of exercise will help you do they, any of the specifics. So I started thinking, okay, well, what is it about exercise that actually helps us to live longer? And so I started looking into that and so I think, well, what are the things that we're generally told will help us live longer? Okay, maybe it's like improved, you know, mitochondrial function. Okay, you know, hey, you're you're able to produce more energy, so your cells do better. Okay, cool. Uh, what about this idea of like um, cleaning up and clearing out damaged cells? This, this process of autophagy. Okay, cool. Let me look into that. Let me look into this whole telomere thing. Um, and what can we do to like maybe prevent our cells from getting damaged in the first place? So like kind of protecting from reactive oxygen species attacks. So those are kind of the four things that that I looked at because those were the things that kept coming up as like reasons why we're getting older or ways to help us live longer. And so I started thinking, okay, well, where does exercise 
fit into all this? Is exercise is going to help us live longer? It has to fit into these stories somehow. And I had this, you know, I had already kind of had this idea through a lot of our training and who, you know, our, our mentors and who we've been exposed to. And then, you know, what I had experienced from that point that exercise was really just about muscle contraction. It really just came down to muscle contraction. And so I thought, okay, well, where does the muscle contraction process fit into mitochondria, fit into autophagy, fit into telomeres, fit into reactive oxygen species. And through grad school, I had studied all the different steps of the muscle contraction process. It's like a super lengthy process, okay? We think, oh, muscle contraction is just acting myosin. There's so much going on uh, just in that. And so I, I thought, okay, well, where, you know, where does this process fit in with these other processes? So I was reading papers and I started coming across, you know, these, um, these enzymes and these or the, these proteins uh, like NRF2 um, and like uh, PGC1 alpha. And I thought, okay, cool. Like I see how that influences mitochondria. Where does muscle contraction come into play? And so I started looking up papers on that um, and kind of just kind of taking it, trying to take it back all the way to the point where I could get it to like, okay, muscle contraction, then this, then these things. And what I came across was this, um, this enzyme AMPK, AMP activated protein kinase. And I thought, holy crap, this is it. This is the thing. Because I knew from the muscle contraction process that um, when the actin and myosin bind, that the, uh, the um, ATP will bind to the myosin head um, and then it'll break apart and it'll become ADP and P. Um, and, you know, a lot of that ADP gets regenerated with it with another P to make more ATP. But sometimes it gets picked up by the enzyme myokinase and two ADPs form together to make an AMP as a result and an ATP. And all of a sudden I had, okay, now I have a place where the muscle contraction process directly influences these things because I could see the production of AMP, then activating AMPK, then initiating the activation of PGC1 alpha of NRF2. And then I could start to piece it together. So I'm like, okay, cool, great. I got it from mitochondria. What about autophagy? What about telomeres? What about reactive oxygen species? And the story was all the same. Mm. It always came back to activation of AMPK, which brought me back to the muscle contraction process. So I'm like, okay, sweet. I got this talk now. You know, I, I delivered it. Like, hey, th it's all about, like, you want to live longer. Your m exercise has to be about contracting your muscles. And that can be done through lifting weights. That can be done through cardio, you know, all, all this other stuff. But it all comes back to muscle contraction. So that's 2019. 2020 comes around and I start thinking, okay, well, what about the other benefits of exercise? What about brain health? What about cardiovascular changes? What about like uh, reducing um, insulin resistance? You know, you talk, you talk about like the, the effect of diabetes and everything like that. Um, you know, what about heart disease? Uh, you know, prevention of chronic disease, all this stuff. And so I started looking into that and every single health benefit that was said that we get from exercise, it all comes back to muscle contraction. And I'm like, okay, wow, this is too important not to organize and put together. And so that that's when I organized, put it all together into my book. And, and when you read my book, that's exactly what it lays out. It's like, hey, like there are so many health benefits that we get from exercise. Um, but why, why is that? What's the thing that's kind of driving it all? And it really all comes back to muscle contraction. And so then in my book, I lay out, hey, here's how muscle contraction improves brain health. Hey, here's how muscle contraction influences cardiovascular health, lowers blood pressure, um, increases size of left ventricle. Here's how, you know, you can grow your... Um, you know, grow areas of your brain that we start to lose over time. Um, the hippocampus and everything like that, that you know, we often relate to various forms of dementia, everything like that. And so that, that was, that, that really became what my whole book was. And then it just further reinforced what we are doing from like an in-person training perspective, like, Hey, this muscle contraction thing, this is so, so, so important. Um, so I put that all together. I took like six months to find all, you know, as many research papers as I could, I think I have like 292 papers or something like that in the book. Like it's, it's, a, it's a thick uh, reference section. Um, and I put it all together and then I think I did like six or seven rewrites of it. Um, 
recorded the audio book, got it all formatted, got it up online. And yeah, I've just been getting really great feedback on it over the last, um, coming up on two years now. It was August 3rd, 2021 that I, that I released it. Oh, that's an awesome, awesome story, man. So uh, this is actually some information I haven't heard of, and I had spent a lot of time listening to professionals, and I've never heard AMP. Is that an energy substrate for uh, for the process that you mentioned, and then that uh, that other what was yeah, it? That, a, the um, AMPK. So yeah, the, yeah. So okay, so AMPK is an enzyme. AMP is often seen as a waste product um, of muscle contraction because what happens is, so we have an enzyme uh, within a, our muscle cells called myokinase, okay? And what myokinase does is it will pick up two ADP molecules and combine them to make one ATP, which is where every, everybody focuses on, mm -hmm. and then one AMP molecule, okay? Now, the thing about myokinase is it's called, it, it's called a, a low, it's what is called a low affinity enzyme. What that means is it needs to have a lot of its substrates present in order to be able to like, get working faster and faster and faster. All right. So it needs a lot of ADP present in order for it to work faster and faster and faster. The more ADP that's present, the more the myokinase work, the more AMP gets, uh, gets produced. Okay. Um, and then the more AMPK activation there is, which then leads to this whole cascade of health benefits. Mm -hmm. So the question is, okay, well, how do you get a whole bunch of ADP in the cell for this myokinase to start going faster and faster and faster? And that is through higher levels of muscle contraction. Essentially, the, the rule of thumb is the longer muscles contract, the more frequently they contract, the more intensely they contract. Um, and and so, the, or sorry, the more muscle mass that contracts, the more frequently it contracts, the higher intensity and the longer it contracts for, the more ADP will get produced, mm -hmm. the, which means the faster this myokinase will go, producing more AMP, more active, which leads to more activation of AMPK, and then ultimately greater health benefits. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, just to uh, highlight the fact that when he says what you just said, the higher intensity and longer, that is not something we're saying to do. <laughs> no, no, no. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So it's, and then, so, and that really was kind of also the, um, the difference of, or, or the, the last part or so something that was woven throughout the, my entire book is like, okay, cool. Yes higher intensities and longer duration appear to create these changes, but only to a point. Mm -hmm. And that point is when muscle damage starts to occur because once muscle damage occurs, there's a spike in TNF alpha. There's a spike in IL one, which are two pro-inflammatory molecules, which have been shown to decrease the uh, rate of muscle protein synthesis, which means you literally build less muscle, uh, mm -hmm. decrease mitochondrial biogenesis, which means, you don't build as much mitochondria like you don't get as fit. Uh, they actually disrupt your insulin receptors, which means you become more insulin resistant to your workouts. So, yes, intensity to a point, oh. it needs to be. And this is where this concept that Tom talks about all the time, like appropriate for somebody body. You do not cross over to that point where you're actually damaging muscle. Once you damage that muscle, that's when you start to get these cascades of negative health benefits. Right. And which could represent uh, present itself in a lot of ways which would be you get sick you get nauseous yes you know, fever, mm -hmm. any of these type of things which just a way of overtraining in a way yeah yeah so i guess you kind of already highlighted this but are there any core principles of your book the exercise uh for life method that you didn't outline like what are what's the paradigm i guess so the uh, like the action? idea is, is it just I, like, I, I beg your pardon is it like actionables, like tactics? And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so here's the thing. Like in the book itself, like there are sections. Of course, now that I'm flipping through, I'm not finding in the sections. Okay, so there's like areas that are like grayed out, right? Like that's like the science heavy stuff, mm -hmm. right? But then the rest of it is like, hey, here's what to do about it. And the entire last chapter is how to put this all together. So like the first seven chapters, I kind of lay out the entire argument for like why – exercising in this way is really an important thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. For your heart, for your brain, for your joints, for your muscles, everything like that. Then the final chapter is putting it all together. Okay. And that actually is leading 
into something that I haven't like fully announced yet, but that's going to be the second book in the series of like, how do we actually go and do this thing consistently? Okay. And be able to come back and do it every single day in a way that builds our health and doesn't break our body down. Okay. And so that is the, the chapter eight. I give like what's called like the bare minimum framework of like, all right, how to get all the health benefits, like doing the bare minimum. And then maybe like what's the optimal benefit, um, optimal framework and then things to consider and everything like that. Um, and so, so that then piece it all together, but then it's, and then at the end, we're kind of left with this question of like, okay, well, why is this even important to begin with? Like, why mm-hmm. does it even matter that we exercise? Look, uh, uh, every single one of us is going to have a day that's going to be our last day. And it, that's just the reality of being alive. Okay. And so it's like, all right, well then why, why does this actually matter? Um, and when I think about that, uh, you know, a lot of times, the thought comes up of like, well, you know, you want to maximize today and you want to be like the best version of yourself. And look, I'm all for that. Okay. But I think it's more than that. And, um, so, so my grandfather, um, my grandfather was, uh, in the Marines is, um, highly, highly active. In fact, uh, when he passed in 2011, uh, like three paragraphs of his obituary were all dedicated, like talking about his workouts and like how into fitness and everything he was like, he worked out all the time. Okay. Well, the last like 10 years or so of his life, he developed Alzheimer's. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, if exercise is supposed to be having all these health benefits, you have this, this man who exercised all the time and a whole bunch and he still developed Alzheimer's. Like, why would I even care about it? And so um, I'm going to bring this full circle. So the, the reason is, the reason why this matters is because my grandfather passed when I was 23 years old. All right. His willingness to exercise day after day after day for the entirety of his life, in a lot of ways, maybe the difference between him passing when I'm 23 and him passing when I'm 13, mm. which means that's the difference between me knowing him like as a young adult versus me knowing, just knowing him as a little kid. Mm. That's the difference between me, like just hearing stories about how great he was versus me actually being able to experience that. And more, and, and furthermore, that's the difference between me being able to pass that along to my kids and their kids versus like just you know it just being a story that kind of gets p- passed down through the family like oh yeah like your great grandfather like really great guy your great great grandfather like really great guy but like be able to actually say no like he was a really great man because of how much of my life I got to spend with him and so a lot of times when we think about like okay well you know, if I'm around for my kids until they're, you know, 45 or 50, you know, if I see my grandchildren born, like that'll be enough. It's like, yeah, but what if you could be, what if it could be more than that? What if you could have an instrumental role in your grandchildren's life to the point where like for the first, you know, 20, 25, 30 years of their life, like you got to be a part of it. And so then every single thing that you got to experience during your life, you got to pass on to not just the next generation, but two generations from now. And so I think when I think about it like that, um, and when I invite people to think about it like that, it it hits at a different, because when we think about just kind of like right here, right now, or one generation deep, it it feels like, well, I'm going to be around long enough. But when we start to go two generations, it's like, okay, yeah, like maybe I actually do want to be there for more than just the birth of my grandchildren. Like maybe I want to be able to, watch them play high school sports. If they do that, maybe I want to be there like to, you know, have them be, have me be somebody that they can call when they're having a tough day. Like if they're in college or whatever, um, like may, if, if I want that, then I need to start taking action on that now. Yeah. I mean, I, that makes perfect sense to me. And I would imagine too, that even though your grandfather said that here that he, you know, had Alzheimer's, all that work he did probably put him in a position to have an easier time with the disease. I imagine, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. And that's a huge thing. Cause I am working with someone who has, it's not Alzheimer's, it's just some form of dementia, but um, you know, she's, she's not 
very strong and uh, she, had, she had trouble walking around and things like that. So the quality of life's very low and you can't really do much at this point right. in the that she's in. But yeah, say she did the work 30 years earlier, she might be walking around just fine, but of course her brain might not be working so well, but her body yeah. might be able to do a lot of what she can't do at this point in time. No, absolutely. And that's that's one of the biggest, uh, what I believe is one of the biggest limitations on so much of the research for exercise and Alzheimer's is that um, from like, if, if you read the research of, of like, okay, how can exercise actually help regrow the areas of the brain that that Alzheimer's affects, it would seem like there's a profound ability for exercise to be able to prevent and potentially even reverse Alzheimer's, or if somebody does develop it, like make it not as severe. But the problem is, is that if somebody hasn't been doing all that much for so much of their life, and then all of a sudden, not only are they physically deconditioned, but they're just physically weak. And now all of a sudden they try to start incorporating an exercise routine. It's like, okay, cool. Like we can maybe get something here. And, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't do it, but if from a research study and then recommendation practice, if that's the only subset of people that we're looking at, it's like we're missing the boat on like everybody else who's doing so much before then and be able to either delay the effects or prevent the effects or potentially something starting to come on a little bit. Extra, they're physically conditioned enough that they can, you know, pick it up a little bit and start to even reverse the effects. Like there's... I don't see why there's any reason why that shouldn't be a possibility, except for the fact that so many people, by the time they get to the stage where they decide to start doing something about it, they're they're at a place where they're like, yeah, my, their body just can't handle it. Right. I mean, it's too late. I mean, most of the muscle mass that we develop happens in our youth. Up mm-hmm. to our so if you don't get a decent amount, then it's really hard, not impossible, but very tough to yeah in your 60s but mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you shouldn't try it's yep. just a whole different process and I'm totally. much um you know you said contraction it all comes down to contraction in the muscles mm-hmm. but that's not the entire picture is it from a person who doesn't have our background they're missing the component of force that needs to go mm-hmm. through the team right because sure. we just sit there and now if you're really weak you could just do an internal contraction and that could be effective sure. but that's not, right you need force so yep. how does force play when you're designing exercise and you're trying to influence uh, specific tissues like exercise design. Do you find that to be a valuable and important piece to this? Absolutely. I mean, pardon me. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Look, the way you are able to keep getting benefits of exercise is if you keep, if you are able to keep coming back to the exercise and if how you are exercising is preventing you from coming back and exercising on a consistent basis, then it's preventing you from coming back and getting the health benefits on a consistent basis. So where does exercise design fit into this? Look, you need to be able to challenge muscles directly if you're wanting to strengthen them and if you're wanting to build those muscles, okay? That's number one. Number two is you have to have the way that you're challenging them not feel lousy for your body. You have to be able to do it in a way that is appropriate for your body, that's tolerable for your body, and that, you know, preferably actually feels pretty darn good for your body. And then that's something that you can keep coming back to. So, yes, you know, having the muscles, it's not just about like, you know, I mean, our muscles are pretty much contracting a lot, you know, throughout the day anyways, right? But it is the intensity of it and then the duration of that intensity and then the frequency of that intensity and how much of our muscle mass system is going through that intensity for that duration with that frequency. So all all of those are components and that's where kind of understanding how to exercise in a way that either suits your client's needs or really suits your personal needs, uh, that's a super big thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. And there's a give and take, right, with intensity, duration, like you can't do a really, really hard thing for a really long time and you can't, you know, and you need to vary your intensities day to day. So it can get a little complicated when you're trying to do that for people. Sure. um, I think the best method, like you said, is how do I feel the day after and can I come back? And if I do feel a little rundown, what can I do today that will set me up for tomorrow? Yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a it's tricky business, and you know you run into some pitfalls, but that's that's part of the game. <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. There's a there's a lot of trial and error, but you know you start to figure it out, especially when somebody can be mindful of the variables within themselves. Um, it's actually pretty pretty remarkable, like how quickly people can see improvement with their own body when they understand like the right things that they need to focus on while they're exercising. 
Yeah. And that's, that's where it's nice to have someone who can guide you into this process. Totally. Of experience, of course. But, uh, yeah. you know, I'm curious, like with your business, with your fitness uh, profession, mm-hmm. what kind of clients do you see on a day to day basis? Like what types of problems are you running into and mm-hmm. trying to solve? Yeah. So a lot of people that I'm, I'm working with. Um, so I work with a lot of guys. I work with a lot of guys that, you know, their background is essentially working out how they learned how to work out in high school athletics and maybe college athletics. And either they're realizing that that's not fitting their body anymore, meaning like, oh, like their shoulders killing them every time they go to work out or their back or their knees are, are bugging them. And so they know they need a different way to work out or they've fallen out of that routine because they don't like the idea of working out how they worked out in high school anymore. They need something that's more suited for their life and certainly suited for their body. So that is kind of the, the population that I work with. Uh, but we do both exercise, uh, do a lot of MAT with people, um, really helping people that have different kind of aches and pains um, coming in and just helping them kind of reestablish uh, that, you know, the, the viability of their, their muscles, being able to access their muscles, being able to contract their muscles, and then being able to progress that into using it, um, using them, their muscles uh, with exercise on a consistent basis. Yeah, using MAT, obviously, to help uh, restore dysfunction in areas mm-hmm. and get able to contract. But like you said, it also brings awareness on how to use it to some mm-hmm. degree. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that seems to be a pretty effective approach for a lot of people when they can't sense different things. Mm-hmm. You know, when you, said you work with men more um, often in these days. Do you find like you have to come up with a different framework when you work with men and women? Do you, do you think of it differently? Like how you approach exercise from maybe a hormonal standpoint, so, things like you that? Know, that's a good question. Um, I haven't thought about it necessarily in those terms. What I have noticed is because Julie, my wife, she works with a lot of women, um, mm-hmm. is what we tend to see is oftentimes guys will feel like pretty solid after they work out. Okay. Because I think like hormonally they're, you know, like you get a testosterone pump going, like, you're like, okay, cool. Like now I feel like more in my masculine self, right. Versus women. That's not necessarily the case. So I think the, the, like how you talk about it and the, um, the expectations of it and the, uh, the framework that you're putting it in, um, is, is it potentially has, it, it can be influenced by that. If you're talking like, Hey, like this is going to be more of, you know, a long-term process versus like, okay, cool. Like, you know, I want you feeling better at the end of this workout. Um, you know, it just, it just kind of as a rough example, but like I said, like I haven't, I haven't thought about that um, too much. I just know that like personality wise, uh, I tend to uh, tend to get along with guys better. Yeah. Well, that's a good balance. You know, you both have uh, work together. So you got. The- yeah, it works out great. Yeah. It sounds yeah. perfect. Yeah. And you do have to really speak to the client's needs, right? I mean, you gotta frame it in, in words that make sense to them because ultimately everything is roughly the same. It's all designed mm-hmm. individual, but yeah. Right? talk differently so that they're not discouraged from doing it mm-hmm. and encouraged and motivated. And that's a big thing because otherwise I won't come back. Right. Um, exactly. What is, I'm, I'm actually curious, what's your process look like when you, when you meet someone new and you bring them in and mm-hmm. you start to work with them? Do you have like a system that you take them through? Yeah. So, you know, come in um, and just, you know, get, get a health history on them, um, assess their body to see how it's moving, you know, trying to find, you know, like, like we're taught in the MAT perspective, like, okay, what side, you know, where are we moving differently on one side versus the other? Um, and that just kind of pieces it together like a, a, a landscape or an overview of like, okay, cool. Like there may be some things that we need to take, you know, be mindful of here versus there. Um, from there, depends if, you know, we're, we're going more into the MAT route and, you know, spending more time on the table or going to the floor and doing uh, more exercise or doing a combination of both. Um, if it is the, you know, the exercise uh, realm, you know, it's a lot of like, okay, cool. Like, let's see just how this motion that we're about to do under load feels without the load to start, you know, just make sure like, okay, cool. Like, you know, no clicking, no popping, you know, nothing weird going on with the joints. All right, great. Um, and then, you know, can you establish that mind muscle connection great is there any tightness is there any kind of difficulty doing the motion and then as we add the load kind of making sure that the focus the emphasis really is on maintaining that contraction maintaining that mind muscle connection keeping that awareness the entire time i find that that if i can keep somebody's awareness 
on the muscle contraction, oftentimes they're much better at kind of respecting their personal range of motion. And they have a much better idea of like when their body is telling them, okay, cool. Like we're, we're good now. We, we need to push this any further. Um, so you're able to, I'm able to get better feedback from them of like actually how challenging the exercise is versus if they're, you know, off in space and they're, they're just trying to crank out reps and like, okay, cool. So like, how did that feel? And they're like, uh, I don't know, like a three. I'm like, okay, really? So anyways, um, that, that's, that's kind of the rough overview of the process. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds really amazing and very in line with what I do. And, you know, on paper sounds perfect, but in the real world, as I'm sure you've run into, most people do not have that kind of awareness or attention span. Sure. Yeah. So well, how do you, uh, voice it to them, the importance of it, and how do you coach them along the mm. way? Save yeah. from someone who has like Lex to zero awareness to muscle contraction. Sure. Trying to get them in tune with that and then yeah. into like doing a 90 second set where they're fully engaged. Like, how do you? Yeah. Get so, through? right. And so, as you're alluding to, like having that mind muscle connection, that's certainly a skill, right? And so, so it's a skill that most people, when they start, they're going to be lousy at. And they, that's just a reality of it. And so, uh, ways that I'll I'll kind of progress them along is uh, different tactile cues using isometrics. Like if we can get people's brains, if I can get somebody's brain off of trying to coordinate the motion and just put them in, you know, in a position where they can just like really try to focus on squeezing their muscles and they may not get it after the first session. They may not get it after, you know, the first month or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if we can at least kind of have that as a thing that we keep coming back to of like, okay, cool. Like before you move, initiate that mind muscle connection. I call it rev that and Great. Rev the engine, make that mind muscle connection, feel your muscle squeeze, and now use that squeeze as the driver of the motion and drive it on the way up and then resist it on the way back down. Don't just, you know, don't just let it lower or whatever, like actually fight it both directions. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we'll play around with different amounts of, of the range of motion that they're using. Um, you know, sometimes like going through a big range of motion can feel um, like, holy crap, that's a lot of like, uh, that, that's a lot that I have to control, like a lot, a lot of, you know, joint motion that I have to control. And so, okay, cool. Let's go uh, a little bit smaller than that. And can we just kind of maintain that contraction there? The biggest challenge I run into with that is, um, a lot of time, you know, if you're really feeling your muscles contract um, and they're starting to fatigue, it doesn't feel that good. Like that <laughs> burning feeling does, it doesn't feel that good for a lot of people. And so trying to be there to support people and be like, OK, I know that I, I know that it's uncomfortable, not from a pain perspective, but from a fatigue perspective, stick with it. Stay, stay, uh, lean into that fatigue, lean into that challenge, because the second somebody starts thinking, OK, no, I just want to think about the motion. It's like, ah, shoot, we did. We, we just lost it from like, OK, now are you um, are you violating your range of motion or anything like that? So, yeah, just it, it's constant reinforcement. Yeah, and that was, uh, you already hit one of the other questions I was going to ask is how do you coach someone through an intense exercise? And that is essentially a great way to do it because, you know, it is not a pleasant sensation. Even mm. people like us, we don't, especially when you're doing a leg extension, it's like the worst. Oh my gosh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah, but you know what that leads to, and it's just time and exposure, right? And I think the underlying thing you're saying is really just have patience and just yes. keep coming back and keep working at it. You're not looking for perfection. It's just right. the process, right? Exactly. About that process, understanding the, again, the timeline that we're playing with. If the timeline that we're playing with is the rest of your life, hopefully that means we have a lot of time to play with. Not that like me and you are going to work together for the rest of your life, but understanding like, hey, the goal here is to be able to do this thing, this exercise thing for the rest of your life, as opposed to, again, the, you know, six weeks, the 30 days, the, the whatever it is. So just so people have actionable tactics here, if you're somebody who someone listening who has trouble connecting with their tissues and can't really feel contractions. And this is a new thing for them based on what you said, and correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like maybe that person could start with doing an isometric for a specific set of muscles, mm -hmm. maybe start with a very small range of motion, maybe mid range, small mm -hmm. little move, get control over the contraction, then expand mm -hmm. on that. And this doesn't have to happen all in one session either. Right. Right. But having these steps of like getting connected. Yeah. Small stay connected, start adding motion, build yep. on it. And then maybe in a month, you're doing a full range with the full yeah. 
traction for a minute or something like that. Absolutely. So let's take the knee, the knee extension example. Um, and so, yeah. All right. Trying to figure out like, okay, what part of your knees bent to your knees straight? Can you really feel like you can lock in and feel your quads? Okay. And so find that part of the range and just kind of stay within that. Mm -hmm. All right. It may not be the full range of motion of your joint, but that's going to be like for that day, that set, that might be the full range of motion of your awareness and keeping that. Now, another thing that I'm really a big fan of, especially um, for for myself, like I, I'll do this all the time when, I, when I'm uh, working out myself, is just giving myself tactile cues. So like if I'm doing the leg extension, like I'll put my hands on my quads mm -hmm. and to really focus in on, you know, all right, this is where I want to feel this sensation. All right. If I'm doing, you know, it, it doesn't always work. Obviously, if you're using your hands to like push or pull something that won't work. But just that idea of like, OK, can I bring some additional sensory awareness to like, hey, just stay locked in here. Just really focus on this. Um, I find that for me, that's very helpful. Yeah, I do the same thing. Uh, I just strap a belt around my waist and hands on my legs the whole time. And I'm suffering and crying. At the yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know, people are motivated by seeing progress and they like numbers. They like to know this is where I started. This is where I'm at and this is where I'm going. How do you track progress? Like, are there, do you do it differently for every person? Like what, what metrics do you use to show people they're going the right direction? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest. I'm not a big tracker of numbers in that way. What I'm much more a tracker of is consistency okay. because I have a, 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 I guess, fundamental belief that if you are consistent with something long enough and you are doing things in the right way, that you will make, you will eventually make the progress that you want to make. Okay. It may not be in the timeline that you want to make, and then you can play with the intensity and everything like that. But really my goal for people is to have the consistency with their exercise. And then anything else on top of that, like I don't weigh my clients. I don't take body measurements or anything like that because my specialty and my job is helping people exercise consistently in a way that doesn't burden their, that, that doesn't uh, break down their body or doesn't burden their life. And, and so it's just like, okay, how many times were you able to exercise this week? How, how much were you able to get up and move throughout your day and help mm -hmm. and be able to be helping people be able to uh, be consistent with that? Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds perfectly fine. That is a metric of in, in itself, right? And you carved out a niche for how you do things. I think that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, the tracking of numbers, is it's often kind of uh, misleading anyway mm -hmm. and maybe puts our egos up and might to push you to do more than you should. You want a set number in your head that you need to do. Sure. But I think in your mind, I feel like maybe I'm wrong, but when you say consistency, you're also saying in your head and not voicing it is it's also progressive in some way. You yeah. Just the same thing all the time. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. So um, our, a lot of times when we think about consistency, we only think about the frequency. But there's actually three types of consistency. That's one of the things I talk about early on in my book. So there's the consistency of frequency, which is like how often you're doing something. There's a consistency of progression, specifically internal progression, meaning like how much like internally within your body are you progressing your body? Not just like the number on the weight stack, but like how much is actually progressing within your body. And then there's a consistency of appropriateness. OK, and if you can nail down the consistency of appropriateness, you're usually able to nail down. You're able to see consistency with progression and consistency with frequency. The problem is, is most people think about consistency just in terms of consistency of frequency. And then they think either they're just going to do the same thing all the time because they know that's what they can do, which isn't a bad option. Or they're thinking, well, because I'm not able to exercise like X number of days per week, I guess I'm not getting any benefit. And so I'm just not going to do it at all. Right. And I'm saying like, actually, that's uh, it, it's not the last thing to focus on, but it's just one of the three types of consistency. So that's where my mind is. Consistency of frequency, consistency of progression, specifically in and then consistency of, of appropriateness. Okay. And when you say progression and aware and internal progression is more like how aware are you? How well you contracting? Yeah. So going going back to like right where we started is like, okay, 
How well are your joints moving during and after your session? How much of an awareness to your muscles do you have during and after? How is your body feeling um, in the in the uh, immediately after and in the hours that follow? Like I've had workouts before where it's like I walk back to my apartment and I lie down on my couch and I wake up three hours later because my, my body was just shot, right? It's like, is that happening? Or do you actually feel energized? Do you feel like ready to get after it? Like you can be fully present with your family and with your kids and be like, yeah, like, I'm here. Like, let's go. Right. And then how do you feel in the days that follow? Do you feel like you wake up the next morning and like, oh, I just got to lie back down, go to bed because my legs are, you know, are, are so shot. Or do you feel like, okay, cool. Like I'm ready to go do this thing again. And so the more you can um, gear all those things towards the positive, to me, those are all signs of positive internal progression. Right. And then as far as the consistency of appropriateness, that appropriateness should shift to a higher volume, a higher intensity. As you mm -hmm. follow these rules, it yeah. also progresses to different levels of intensity, different types yeah. of changes. And that's exactly. I really like that framework. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's very simple and easy to understand, which is a big thing. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah. Um, you know, we're almost near the end here, but I do just want to touch on something because I'm sure you'll have some valuable insights on is recovery, right? Mm. Because, yeah, say we are working out every day, uh, there are going to be some useful things that help people recover. Uh, sure. I wonder how much you dabble in that and yeah. what, it's like, what kind of suggestions you, you bring to the fold for people. Yeah, so I um, I love the idea. So two big things. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to say three big things. Okay. Uh, number one is... Um, like actual recovery workouts. Okay. So um, recovery workout for me is like steady state cardio, 20 to 30 minutes, keeping my heart rate kind of 55 to 65% of my heart rate max. Okay. And, and so what I would find when I would measure my HRV consistently, when my HRV would start to drop down, when I would do one of those workouts, my HRV would pop back right back up the next day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, that's like, like a recovery workout. Okay. Um, then, I, um, then from a like workout scheduling perspective, I'll go three really intense weeks followed by one deload week. And mm -hmm. I've been following this system since 2009. Okay. And what that one deload week is, is I go in and I do the work as I normally do at like 50 to 80% of the intensity and 50 to 80% of the volume. All right. So if I'm doing a chest press, say with um, with 200 pounds, I'd cut that either, you know, anywhere from like 100 to 160 pounds. But I'm doing in and instead of like, you know, uh, five sets of 10, I might do four sets of 10. So I'm reducing the intensity. I'm reducing the volume, but I'm still doing the same exercises. I do that for a week straight for all of my workouts. And then I come back and I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm ready to go again. And mm -hmm. I implement that deload week, whether I feel like I need it or not. I'm not waiting until my body's feeling all symptomatic and everything like that to implement it. A lot of times I go into my deload week feeling great. And then I leave my deload week feeling even better. OK, so that's a second strategy. And then the third strategy is just, well, okay, aside from um, doing different stuff, but just from an exercise perspective, um, the third strategy is just exercising in a way that's actually appropriate for your body. And, and that, that, that consistency of appropriateness really is a big thing. Working out today in a way that sets yourself up to come back and work out again tomorrow. Okay. Look, I, I'm a big believer. I've seen traumatic changes in myself and my clients uh, using things like MAT to help my body recover. And, you know, I'm, I'm all about that. Um, but if you can exercise in a way that you don't feel like you dip down a whole bunch after every workout, but you actually build with every workout, that whole need to go and just like spend a whole bunch of time recovering, you, you don't need it as much. I see. So all the biohacks that people use to try to bounce back from these crazy intense sure. training might not be as necessary, but useful in other ways to optimize and maybe promote some other health benefits. We don't need to go into all those things. Right, like right. And again, it's a timeline thing. I'm thinking like, what can I do that I can keep doing for the rest of my life? You know, a lot of people when they're trying to, they're trying to take things that maybe like professional athletes are trying to use to how, how can they bounce back within a week, you know, after like a really intense, you know, football game, how they can they get back, you know, for to ready to play the very next week. And it's like, okay, cool. But like, you're not exercising at that level of intensity and you're not, they're not playing professional football for the entirety of their life. So like, those are two really big factors, mm -hmm. but having things along the way that can keep your body working well, having things that you can do practitioners that you can see to keep your body working. Well, I, I'm a big believer in that. 
you know, it's interesting. And I, I uh, in the research, when you, when you mentioned doing a three week hard and one week reload, mm -hmm. it, uh, it's funny because I was just listening to this guy, Andy Galp, and he's like some mm -hmm. guy named uh, here somewhere in California University, um, you know, muscle physiology and whatnot, uh, professor. And he, he was mentioning more mainstream industry type of suggestions where you do like a, an eight week, six to eight week program in a mm -hmm. one week. Which, you know, I I just did one recently, like a hypertrophy six week thing. Mm -hmm. And I got through it okay, you know, in my history. But man, it was by the f f fourth, fifth week, I'm starting to feel like I'm breaking down more yeah. stuff in my tendons. And I'm like, yeah. this might be a little too long, or because I kept progressing the load every week. Sure. You know, and it was like, uh, yeah, I, I kind of like this idea that you're mentioning, you know, a little mm -hmm. shorter time frame, a little more often yep. break might be safer way to go about it, mm -hmm. um, especially a longer term thing. So different yeah. perspectives, I suppose, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, you know, this was really awesome, man. You gave us a lot of great information, and I, I feel like we barely even talked. <laughs> <laughs> and so much more we could cover. I only asked <laughs> half of the questions on this list, so maybe we should. That's cool. Some. That would be awesome. I would love that, man. We can definitely get that scheduled. Awesome. Uh, do you do do online consulting? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just, my wife and I, um, just launched a uh, a membership program, um, and that is teaching people the principles that we use with our clients in person, how they can start applying them to themselves, their own workouts, their body when they're working out at home. You can do it when you work out in the gym as well, but like you know, the people that we are gearing towards are like, hey, when you're when you're working out at home, so it's teaching you all the stuff, the awareness, the range of motion, everything like that, how to go about implementing that into your own workouts. And so um, everything that you can find is just at uh, exerciseforlifestudios.com. Um, I guess technically you need to put the www in front, otherwise it goes to some weird page. But oh. www.exerciseforlifestudios.com. You can find out more about it there. Um, you can you know click the membership button and in and find out all the options and everything like that oh cool that's awesome man and it's just so just touching on your book again you said you did the yeah. audible too right yeah so uh that was actually my last run through of edits is i recorded the audiobook um i was like okay cool like i feel like yeah so i i short answer yes i, I recorded the audiobook for that did as you, well it's, did, you did the voiceover i did yeah oh nice that's awesome. it, it was exhausting <laughs> how long did that take you um Oh, you know, the thing about it is, is like you'd start reading and then I would be thinking about my vocal tonality and be like, oh, I just sounded so mundane over the last, you know, like three paragraphs. So you go back and you like re-record it. Um, I probably recorded the whole thing in chunks over the course of about a week. Uh, awesome. Yeah, but there, there's there was one night where I recorded like two or three chapters and they were the longest chapters. And it's just like I was just fried after that, like so, <laughs> so talked out. Yeah, yeah, that's well. Good thing you're you're a good talker and you're energetic. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, that won't be that will be. I'll actually I'll probably uh, download that then if it's on Audible. It's uh it's not on Audible, but I, I'll I'll send you the link. Yeah, I'll send it over okay. your way. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, man. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy life is these days, but uh, no, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And then uh, we'll we'll we I'll reach out. And we'll see if we can do this again. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely do it again. Thank you, man. All right, you have a great uh, weekend, and I'll uh, well. talk. Take All care. right, right on. Yeah, you bet.